Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, it is a blockbuster week at the movies. We've been go- we were gone last week, and now we're back. And we got too many movies to talk about. We did it again. We got a threefer. Three films. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. And Nimona over on Netflix, which we're talking about at the end. Uh, it does not at all fit in the genre of these other two action-oriented live-action features. But... Uh, stick around for the end of the review. All right, there's there's, there's something to that movie. Uh, Mission Impossible is wild. Indiana Jones is a trip. Andy, general impressions. It's the first week of July. Well, it's the second week of July now. Whatever. We're halfway into July. Barbenheimer's next week. Where are we at? How do you feel? Man, it's it's been quite the year of, of movies. We've had some surprises, some some big hits, some big flops, which we're gonna get into, into more. Uh, it's, it's a struggle for, I mean, the, the summer is just crowded. Uh, you know, we had like five blockbuster releases in June. We have three and four basically within three weeks in July. Um, so, and we got the fall slate, which is ridiculous. A bunch of, um, really big movies coming out in, in the fall, which we hadn't, haven't had in a, in a while. So it's exciting times. It's true. We're talking about trailers in the middle of the show, uh, so keep an ear out for that. We're going to talk about some things that are coming up. Before we get to all that, we need to talk about the news. Uh, our first story this week, Andy, we've got to talk about Deadpool 3. I don't want to talk about Deadpool 3. I don't think Deadpool 3 is worth talking about. They're still making the movie. <laughs> but these set photos are coming out of like Hugh Jackman on set, and, and they've got other people who are confirmed to come back from it, and from the 20th Century Fox universe, and like I... It just feels like it's going to be member berries. What's going on? So w- one of the big uh, things, they released some set photos. Uh, they released like some pictures of Deadpool, but also ones of Hugh Jackman as Wolverine. And he's wearing the kind of stereotypical yellow, bright yellow suit uh, that he wore in like the 90s cartoon and that he did in the very early iterations of the comic. Um, and a lot of people are kind of excited about it. And we've also heard rumors that... Uh, Jennifer Garner's back as Electra, reprising her character from 2004's uh, Deadpool, uh, not Deadpool, uh, Daredevil. Uh, also, be- rumors Ben Affleck is going to be back, as well as Ian McKellen and uh, Patrick Stewart as Professor X and Magneto. All these, all these characters from the 20th Century Fox uh, X Men franchises seem to be. Looks like they're going to be making an appearance in Deadpool three. And I can't roll my eyes any harder at all these headlines. Deadpool 3 has got a lot of work to do because it's no longer just a 20th Century Fox property like it was, right? Disney bought 20th Century Fox right around the pandemic. Uh, they absorbed that studio, uh, cut some things like Blue Sky Animation, which we'll be talking about in that Nimona review at the end of the show. Stick around. Uh, but also, like, acquiring Deadpool meant that Disney, you know, has to decide whether it's going to continue being an R-rated thing or it's going to kind of be a little bit more marveled up, right? Maybe it'll be like a collaborative thing like they're doing with Sony and Sony spider-man and spider-man villain features uh but no it seems like it's still going to be uh the fun yak it up like break the fourth wall ryan reynolds features that we all know and love like deadpool one and two but also including now uh wolverine which initially i think was an exciting announcement for hugh jackman fans who doesn't who doesn't want to see hugh jackman play wolverine everybody loves him my man's wolverine till the end of time i don't put it on his tombstone. I, recast Stop. let the there man was a time, rest though. there let was a the t- man eat bread Andy, <laughs> Andy has a good, Andy has a deep respect for James Mangold's Logan. All right, I, and and it's worth mentioning that was a great outing for the character. So for what it's worth, I think some of us are sore on the idea of seeing him again a little bit. Uh, now we're finding out like it's going to be a whole 20th century Fox bonanza, right? Daredevil and Elektra and other X Men. There was a le- leaked set photo of like a, a, a 20th century Fox logo like sticking out of the dirt, like uh, the statue at the end of Planet of the Apes. Like I, I don't know where Deadpool three is headed, but like it feels like it's five years too late, right? Like it feels like it's too. I I don't care anymore. There was a time I would have thought this was cool, um, not now though. Am I crazy? Am I just getting old? What do you think? No, I, I I have said for the longest time, recast these roles. Let, like I said, let Hugh Jackman rest. Let him eat, eat bread. Let, let him, like, he, he's bread. in his mid-50s mid, mid 50s now. Like, cast some up-and-coming 20-something, 30-something actor to get ripped. And, like, you know, or there was rumors that Daphne Keene was going to maybe have, a, a, a you know, a movie as X2, like, kind of the uh, spiritual sequel to, to Wolverine. Something... Please just let these old ass actors rest, and and it would be so much more exciting to re- recast 
a young version or, you know, a, a younger version of these th than we have um, d to me. And I think there's a lot of internet hype for it. And I'm sure people, a lot of people will see the movie, but it's just not as exciting as if you just took a fresh crack at it. Yeah. No hate on like older actors getting the bag. Right. Like I got no problem with that. Like see, and sometimes it can be kind of fun seeing them come back, but like, the, the the trope of like every two hundred and fifty million dollar feature has to has to have like a he a heavy helping of nostalgia included is just getting old for me, man. Like I know we do a movie podcast, so who cares? But like I, I just can't I can't do it anymore. I can't. It's too much. I can't I can't watch the old Jurassic Park crew run around Jurassic World three. I can't watch the old X Men crew run around in Deadpool three. Like it just it yeah. just makes my brain melt out on the I mean the floor. like it was very exciting when like X Men First Class came out, and they did recast the ro those roles. And you had James McAvoy as Young Professor X, and Michael Fassbender as a great Magneto. Like those were ex those movies were exciting because they had revisioned these characters as with younger actors. And it was like you can do this again. You have a fresh like you bought this property. Like use it to make new <laughs> yes. movies. Yeah, I mean, it, like in a small optimistic way, that's part of what excited me about like New Mutants when that movie came out. Because I was like, you got character from Game of Thrones, character from Stranger Things, and Anya Taylor Joy, plus a couple others running around goofing off with mutant powers. Like that's that's something you could make a couple movies out of that. But like now, that just got tied up in the Disney twentieth century merger and didn't end up really becoming anything. Uh, speaking of nostalgia not paying off, we got to talk about Indiana Jones getting bombed out at the box office. <laughs> <laughs> uh indiana jones 5 we're coming to find cost like 300 million dollars to make before marketing which is insane and uh disney's not making that money back uh people are just not that excited about it crystal skull came out 15 years ago now which is bananas was it actually 15 god i think 15 it was. years 15 years <laughs> I makes me feel as old as Indiana Jones himself. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and, and people just don't seem that into it. Meanwhile, Insidious 5 is handily beating back its own budget and turning a profit, albeit small. What, what the hell's going on at the box office, Andy? So Insidious 5 came in number one at the box office, making more money, came in at $30 million, making more money this weekend than Indiana Jones had. Uh, Indiana Jones and the dialed back uh, box office <laughs> returns. Insidious 5, which had terrible reviews, it was not well re re reviewed at all, but horror just does really well a lot of times, and so it came back, it was made on a $15, $16 million budget, so it's already made that back, it's well into profit territory, um, it's embarrassing when a, a franchise as old and as storied as Indiana Jones is, is flailing in its, in its sophomore weekend to a, a low budget horror movie. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, also was a huge laugh seeing Pixar's Elemental pass The Flash in terms of domestic earnings. Uh, the Flash from Warner Brothers, also a big old flop. Good try, but $200 million simply isn't enough. It's wild to me that you can get a movie in front of so many eyes, right? Pull box office number, $200 million, right? That's huge. That'd be huge for Insidious. But, like, these movies cost so much to make that <laughs> it doesn't even dent the top of the water. It's crazy to me. And then, yeah, Insidious 5, which is functionally, I hear, pretty bad. It's Patrick Wilson's first directorial debut, like... Not everybody gets it right first time. It's fine. Like, no worries. Uh, it's, I'm sure it's a fine movie. But, like, yeah, it's making its money back plus some, which is wild to me. Like, I, I – this is – it's like it's like brain rot at the cinema, right? Like, not to be a cynic, but, like, this is what feels like we're all, we're all just going down the tube together. Like, expensive movies aren't turning anything, and cheap, terrible movies are the way forward. <laughs> yeah. And, and even – I mean, something like Across the Spider-Verse, not a cheap movie, $100 million, but – it's also just crossed 600 million at, at the box office. So it's, you know, they're seeing big returns on that. So it's the quality uh, counts, the, the pro like how you handle the, the properties counts. Uh, the Flash is bombing for different reasons is that Indiana Jones is, is bombing, which we will talk about a little bit later. One thing's for sure uh, before we move into our Indiana Jones review, uh, Disney has got to start to get it together, dude. Like, they are, they're, they're becoming like the studio of bombs. Their originals aren't that good. Their live actions, their live actions are just cannibalizing their old features. And Indiana Jones 5, Frozen 3, 
Toy Story Five. Like, how long are we gonna keep doing this? You know what I mean? Like, you, they gotta get some. They gotta get some smoke. Spider Verse is great. Super Mario is great. Uh, Mission Impossible ain't even that bad. We're talking. God, we're talking about that in a few minutes too. We gotta get to reviews. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Uh, but boy, like what a what a week at the box office. Uh, with that, we should move into it uh, proper. Uh, a quick something for this episode. Uh, for those of you watching on Facebook, I just want to mention, uh, I'm trying a new video format with uh, the reviews that we're running. It features trailer footage that's chopped up. Uh, it should be fine, but if it's weird, you know, apologies. We'll be back to our usual programming next week. Uh, with that, uh, this is our review for Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. So, it's 1960, or somewhere around there. Man is landing on the moon, right? Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band is out, and the world is changing. And tired archaeologist Indiana Jones just doesn't feel like he has a place in, in it anymore. Uh <laughs> Indy is just about retired uh, from his job teaching, and he just does not feel like he can connect with the youth. Uh, when suddenly a stranger comes in out of his life, uh, asking about one half of a strange dial of destiny that's reported to have maybe even powers to move mountains and transport man through time. Uh, and Indy has to decide whether or not he'll go on one last ride, one last hurrah in his final adventure in Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. It is a James Mangold film, just came out a couple weeks ago now. Andy, what do you think? It was okay. <laughs> there were, <laughs> it's a mixed bag. This like a, a lot right. of these, yeah. even, the, even, right. these movies, yeah. even these movies that flop are generally a mixed bag. Like there, there's things that work, there's good things in them, and then there's a lot that doesn't <laughs> a lot of times. And that's that's how this is. Um I think the characters are the strongest part. I like it it Harrison Ford is always good and he's as good as he can be as Indy. You got Mads Mickelson as the villain who was born to play every villain ever. Phoebe Phoebe Waller Bridge is uh I, I like her character. She's she's nice and spunky, it has a lot of personality to to the franchise. Some people don't don't really like her um character. I thought she was fine. But the characters I think are the strongest part. The plot is just not super interesting. It takes forever to get going. Uh there's prolonged action sequences that you're just like looking at your watch trying to get through. Um I did like the second half of this better than than the first half of it just takes kind of forever to uh get going. Yeah, I've heard a lot of people say, uh, you know, yeah, I want to go see Indiana Jones, but I, I feel like I got burned by Crystal Skull. So I've heard, heard people say, right? Like, I was excited about Crystal Skull, and then I came out and just didn't do it. And that was supposed to be the last one. Crystal Skull was supposed to be it 15 years ago. Uh, not so now, right? And I feel like I can confidently say I, I like this one more than Crystal Skull. Like, although Spielberg is not returning uh, to do this feature, uh, it does feel like it ties more into, like, the traditional elements that indie fans seem to like. Uh, things like in Raiders and... Uh, Last Crusade, bit of like Christian imagery, right? In in its artifacts, and you got the Nazis back. Uh, you even got a bit of uh, uh, at least visual time travel in an opening flashback scene when we get uh, a young Indy, right? Uh, in, in, they do the deep fake thing. Uh, what do you? <laughs> how do you think about that, Andy? Did you go for it? Because I, I was I was really middling on it. So that's how I felt. It it's fine. It that technology is looking better, but to me, it still just looks, it it still doesn't look real. It looks like a video game cutscene. It takes me out of it. it. It's, I mean, it's, if you don't watch a lot of movies, it's probably amazing. The the theater I went to, uh, the screen that I went to was an older crowd, which is something we'll talk about <laughs> more later. Um, and they were amazed. They, they were like gasps when, when they revealed Indiana Jones, <laughs> even though we had seen that in, in the trailer. Oh um, my God. But sorry, it, it, it's done as well as as it can be. It's to me, it's just not convincing. Like you know, I would rather them just recast it as someone young. Because the other thing is like you can't. His voice still sounds like the voice of an eighty year old man. Yeah, does does feel like a distinct lack of confidence in like the ability of a younger, newer actor to pick up the mantle. I I, I said before, and I'll say it again. They should just grabbed Alden Ehrenreich. They shouldn't use Alden Ehrenreich. I I know they shouldn't, but. 
I, I, I think what's here is effective, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Nazi stuff works. Everybody loves swinging on Nazis. Like that feels very big. I know they were in Crystal Skull as well, kind of. But uh, I, I think that's effective. More importantly, like we need to talk about the, the artifacts, right? Like the dial. Uh, the dial of destiny, I think, is solid like for what it needs to be like it's not quite as exciting as like the arc of no, nothing will ever be as exciting as the arc of the covenant in these movies like that's that's the best one it's got the best theme uh but the dial like i think is an effective plot device if you don't look at it too harshly because uh, if you're too critical you're gonna get you're not gonna think i don't think you're gonna think anita jones is particularly heat but like if you squint your eyes and you kind of look at it or you, I don't know, you eat your popcorn and you don't pay attention. Like overall the plot works fine. Your dial's split into two parts. We got to get the one part and we got to get over here and get the other part before these other guys get it. Ah, they got it before we like, it, it just feels a little plain. I, satisfingly though, I think in this third act takes a turn and actually goes somewhere. I didn't expect it was nice. It was a nice <laughs> surprise to be like, Oh, I don't, I don't know where Indiana Jones is headed. Yeah. We did have some, some predictions, uh, beforehand which did not come to pass some some did but uh, some did not come to pass they mostly had to do with ridiculous time travel yeah things. thank thank god those didn't come to pass because they would have like, it would have been a worse movie for it like indiana jones fighting himself uh, or, <laughs> or indiana jones old indy fighting time. young indy god yeah that would right been, yeah. or indiana jones through through time so we didn't do any of that to me the plot is just really bland more than anything even crystal skull is more intriguing i, I think where crystal skull goes wrong is, is it really doesn't stick the landing at all and it has a lot of really bad cgi but the the initial mystery is more intriguing and the thing about this it's not that it was bad it was just uninteresting i was just so bored and like i didn't get into the myth of the the artifact the dial um i consequently i i ended up watching both uh, i crystal skull and last crusade after seeing this and uh, Last Crusade probably goes the heaviest on the lore. It goes so heavy on the Grail lore. It makes you think that, like, I'm going to go out and find that thing. That thing is real. Um, and the the dial, it just didn't intrigue me in, in the same way. And, I, and I've said this before, that it's a very hard thing to do to come up with some sort of mysterious artifact that gets it really makes people lean in. Yeah, Crystal Skull had that problem. Like, it wasn't that interesting. It was like a weird alien skull thing that looked plastic and nobody really went for it. Like, even the Chakra Stones in uh, Indy 2, Temple of Doom, like, I think worked out. But regardless, uh, the action in this movie, I think, is important to talk about, of course. I do think it's better than Crystal Skull because the CGI is a little more believable. But, like, tragically, there's there's a serious lack of practical effects, not only for budgetary reasons, but also because, you know, Harrison Ford's, like, 80 years old. Like, I don't expect to actually see him get up on a horse. So what you're going to get is a whole lot of, like, green screen stuff, studio footage that they, you know, dress up and add some motion blur to and slap Indiana Jones' face on. And there, there you go. You got your scene. Uh, it doesn't it doesn't work that good. It works fine. But but like uh, combine that with like troubling pacing in the script. They've got, they've got a chase scene in act two where two characters are arguing uh, across vehicles and it's miserable. It just goes on forever. <laughs> it's, there, there, it's like I feel like I should get up and go to the bathroom. Yeah. Like this is not this is not work. there's two chase scenes that just go on forever. They're way too long. And the whole time I was thinking and they're fine. They're not bad. But I was also thinking Mission Impossible is going to blow this out of the water in a week. Yeah, um, I know it. Um, I did want to mention, I was saying that I saw it with a little bit older crowd. Um, this movie has primarily attracted the like over 40, over 50 crowd, distinct lack of, of younger people. Um, and everyone in my theater loved it, but it, it also felt like they hadn't seen a movie since Crystal Skull. <laughs> because because they they were cheering at a lot of you know things during the action scenes and like I said when in, Indy's hood gets pulled off and it was like they hadn't seen a movie in just quite quite some time and I was like it's great that you're attracting the older crowd because that is difficult in its own right but you're not going to make your money back on a three hundred million dollar movie if you, if it's not a four quadrant film that gets everyone and their family and their kids and their mother in to see it. Yeah, the budget here just does not add up because you would think for $300 million, it's going to be like a grand event, right? Like you're going to see incredible things on screen and like you kind of don't. And it's like, where did the money go? I think it went to reshoots. Uh, There's a couple of like basic editing errors in the movie. Like my dad, who is not a big like film critic by any means, like was watching it with me in theaters and he like leaned over and nudged me. He's like, hey, what? 
did that thing break in an earlier scene? And I was like, yeah, shut up. Just ignore it. <laughs> I don't, don't think about it too hard, right? Like, hold on. That does, this, this doesn't make sense. And it's like, totally. Like, you look too hard at it. It falls apart. But for, a, for an adventure that, that moves, I think it's fine. I'll be a little long. I do want to mention uh, the score uh, from... John Williams. Last one, right? Like, it's uh, as far as I know, he's retiring after this one. It didn't really stand out that much to me. It just you just hear a lot of the familiar Indiana Jones yes. cues, but like, like I actually I really like the the entire score to Crystal Skull. That one actually might be my favorite from beginning to end. Like I, I as opposed like I like some, a lot of the tracks on the other ones are, are I like more or more famous, but I love all of Crystal Skull. And on this, there was nothing special. Like I don't know what the theme of like the Dial of Destiny is. Whereas, like, I could sing you the theme to the Grail and the Ark. And yes, I can Crystal hum the Skull. Ark theme. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah I, I, I felt like Williams seemed tired, and like I don't put it past him, right? I, I bet he doesn't even compose most of his stuff anymore. He's probably got ghost composers or whatever. Um, but it is a lot of the old themes, which all sound great. No complaints. Like they're all good stuff. But like, I'm reminded of. Temple is my favorite one, I think. And uh, Temple has a theme for like every character. Short Round's got a theme. Willie's got a theme. Indy's got a theme. Uh, Kali's got a theme. And they like weave them in between, like in scenes. It'll cut from one to the other. Like the way Williams would just go out of his way to jump through flame and hoops. Like, and, and this one, I feel the <laughs> energy of that because it uses a lot of that old music. But uh, you know, he's retiring and God bless sing him. the crystal skull or sing the dial of destiny. Theme. <laughs> you can't, you can't. Hum you the can't. dial of destiny theme for us. No, I sure can't. I absolutely can't. It's fine. Uh, performances fine all around few complaints. Uh, love Mads Mikkelsen as a villain. Phoebe Waller bridge is pretty good. Albeit her character is a little overwritten. I think, uh, could have simplified. Um, any other thoughts on this one, Andy? I, I feel like I should have more well, to yeah, say, but you I, know, I what, what to, else is there to say? I did want to talk about her because I, what I'm glad they didn't do, I, I was worried they would do this very strong, like feminist, uh, thing, which, which they, they didn't, but they, they also make her kind of a, uh, an antihero where like we, we meet her and she is, um, she's like running for people and she has a gambling problem and she owes a lot of people money. And it, you know, she like, like many, uh, kind of people in the Indiana Jones films, she's an opportunist and she'll kind of change allegiances based on the best deal. And th this, that's actually a common character in, in all of the Indiana Jones films. So she kind of embodies that, but is also someone who's kind of closer to him than uh, in some previous films. Yeah, which I think was good, right? Like you don't quite want the mutt set up from Crystal Skull where it's like, I'm your kid and you know, you're, you're dad now. Like that doesn't, quite get you over it worked once i think if they had done the same thing it wouldn't have she she serves a fine role i think for for what she needs to do it has pretty good energy i don't understand how that woman has been functionally nothing since fleabag although she was the voice and uh voice of one of the droids and solo either way uh overall Indiana jones five a fine movie i suppose uh you ready for recommendations andy i am andy would you recommend indiana jones and the dial of destiny I think your enjoyment of this will depend on your relationship to Harrison Ford and the Indiana Jones franchise. Because I've heard people like tearing up, people that saw Raiders of the Lost Ark when they were ten, seeing him still on back on the screen, they're brought to tears and they're they're happy to be back in this world with this character. Um, for me, like I I would say, kind of save it for streaming. There's nothing r really big that happens on screen that justifies like the huge big uh, theatrical experience i saw it in in imax and it was again i was asking where's this 300 million dollars going to because i don't see it on screen <laughs> at, at all so um i would say save it for for streaming unless you're like a huge huge fan i think i'm in the same boat i think indiana jones 5 like i said i think i like it more than crystal skull uh, personally uh, but I don't know if it's better. Um, I just think I prefer it. I think it's got a little bit more something to it that I like. Je ne sais quoi, as they say. You could absolutely wait for this to show up on Disney Plus in like 90 days. Like, there's no reason you need to go see this at the theater. You do not need to spend money on popcorn. Like, you could totally wait, watch this at home. Then you might want to roll back and watch another one. You know, like, I think it... It, it scratches the itch for an Indiana Jones movie, but frankly, I, I don't think anybody was itching for one anyway. And in that way... 
That's Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. Uh, with that, the franchise, to, the franchise belongs in a museum. It sure does. Uh, next up, we need to talk about some things that are coming out soon. Uh, Andy, you want to intro this for us? It's time for the trailer park. So we're going to be bringing up three, a couple of new trailers and then one kind of full trailer that we've seen. So we'll start with uh, the first full trailer of Killers of the Flower Moon came out just a few days ago. This is the big next uh, Martin Scorsese feature uh, featuring uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. It, it deals with a series of murder in uh, Oklahoma oil country in the uh, what looks like the 20s. Um, this trailer looks amazing. We, we It got me so hyped. We get a little bit more plot in, uh, about the movie, and we see that there is uh, the kind of indigenous population uh, American Indians have found oil on their land and they have become wealthy for it. And then there are lots of opportunists who are want to come and take away that, that wealth. And so, uh, we see kind of, uh, warring things happen between the different factions, these businessmen trying to take, basically take the oil from, from the Indians and them defending that, um, man, th- th- this trailer got me super excited uh, about it more, more than the first one. What did you think, Zach? Uh, I'm in the same boat. I saw this trailer just before Mission Impossible yesterday. Uh, it plays great on the big screen. Fantastic music. Great rhythm. It's funny because I don't know Scorsese's features to be cut in the way this trailer is put together, but it's just got such an energy to it. And that's what Scorsese movies bring. The best trailers make you feel something, right? They emote how you'll feel when you're watching the feature. And in that way, like the excitement I get from watching the Killers of the Flower Moon trailer, can't wait. It's going to be great stuff. Got to watch it in theater. I know it's an Apple original. I know it's going to be on Apple TV Plus, but I think they'll do theatrical for a few weeks, and we are totally going to catch it on the show if we can. Right. So yeah. just a word on that. Uh, what Apple is doing and what a lot of st- streamers are doing are, are doing a big theatrical push first so they can make a big kind of step in, in like the Hollywood space and in the movie making space um, and then also use that to promote their streaming service. They, they realize if you if you have a big movie like killers of the flower moon and you just release it on streaming, it doesn't make have quite the kind of cultural impact business impact Hollywood impact that if you put it in, in theater. So that's why we're seeing a lot of studios and Amazon is doing this as well. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, Netflix can like barely be bothered, put glass onion out in 600 theaters for a week. Uh, but we covered it on the show anyway, and it was a good watch. Uh, next movie we need to talk about is Napoleon. Uh, so the trailer for Ridley Scott's uh, Napoleon uh, has dropped. It is Napoleon Bonaparte's uh, origins and a swift, ruthless climb to emperor. Uh, viewed through the prism of his addictive and often volatile relationship with his wife and one true love, Josephine. That's according to IMDb. Of course, film stars Joaquin Phoenix as the titular Napoleon uh, and Vanessa Kirby as Josephine, his uh, beau, I guess. She also features in uh, Mission Impossible, which is wild. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. Uh and it's just me or does this movie look super cool? <laughs> this looks great. This this is a return to like uh we, we used to call it sword and sandal, but it's not but it's like we, we haven't seen the, these kind of big Hollywood epics that they haven't made them for quite some time. Yeah. And Ridley Scott is like the perfect fit for this, right? Gladiator, Alien, uh most recently The Last Duel, which a lot of people slept on. I mean the Martian, for God's sake. Like Ridley Scott is very talented at making big epics. And I know, like, the Napoleon movie was up in the air for years. Uh, 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 Stanley Kubrick infamously wanted to make a Napoleon film, and uh, Spielberg had thought about kind of picking it up and running with it for a while. I don't know if this is, like, the descendant of that project, but something spurned this. Maybe it was a writer who wrote a book this is based on. I'm not really sure. But uh, either way, dude, this looks super good. Like, Joaquin Phoenix looks so serious. Like, he just looks so... (laughs) So dour. And man's doing Shakespeare. I love it. Even in the big goofy hat. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I just love the scope of this. We have these big battle scenes where there's a field of men on actual horses in uniform, sabers drawn. You have these, I mean, just when, when they take the time to like put several hundred people in costume and choreograph these battle scenes, I'm, like we just haven't had a movie like that in, in a long time. This comes out around Thanksgiving. Super excited for it. You know, it's funny. Uh, I was just rewatching Damien Chazelle's Babylon over the weekend, 
And that just you just saying that reminds me of like that great scene when uh, at the end of the first act when like Manny and Brad Pitt arrive at uh, this like shoot that Spike Jones is like German director is organizing and there's all these extras out there on strike. There are all these homeless dudes and they get put on all this goofy armor and swords and stuff and they go out and start swinging on each other like this big battle scene and they're filming it and dudes are getting genuinely hurt like uh yeah like the idea of physically going out and doing stuff is is bananas and nobody does it anymore so it's really exciting when somebody does shout out to ridley scott i hope napoleon is good uh one more andy what, what do you got just this afternoon the uh trailer for wonka dropped this is the, uh, a prequel to uh willie walk and the chocolate factory uh and the tagline is how how willie became wonka and it, it's it's a musical it, it's genius it's directed by uh paul king who famously directed paddington 2 one of the best films all of all time which i haven't seen but that's all i hear My God. about paddington 2 um uh this looks like a lot of fun it's whimsical it, it shows uh timothy chalamet's tr- trying to um open up a, a chocolate shop in a space where people don't want chocolate shops because there's other rivals um this looks very whimsical very family oriented fun i'm usually not excited about these kinds of movies but uh he got me he got me chalamet did it (laughs) it's funny Uh, i'm I'm, go ahead i'm yeah i'm i'm so i'm looking forward to this this comes out december 15th it's funny chalamet like often plays quirky but like downplayed right like paul atreides is special and different but like he's not like twee and and uh, his character in uh bones and all like yeah I forget his name he's got like red hair and he's an outcast but he's not like quirky you know what i mean like he's different but not like odd and wonka is not that uh it is going to be chalamet cranking like foot on the gas got to be energetic and excited and to, like be you know jovial about things and i'm curious to see how he holds up i think the trailer looks fine the best part of it to me is from the director of paddington <laughs> <laughs> balking because uh, that gives me a lot of confidence like okay well hey paddington one and two are both fantastic uh I, we should watch them for the show andy at some point um yeah i i, I think wonka might be good i don't know we'll, we'll have to see I, I don't have many hot takes on it especially uh what is it hugh grant as an oompa loompa at the end which looks <laughs> real rough like i don't know I'm anyway. Uh, it looks like it has that family magic, and if like if a family film really hits and finds an audience, it'll ha- ha- have legs and be like a Christmas hit. Um, it could really be something like that. I think. Right. Well, it's got to be a Christmas hit for sure, because uh, it's coming out this holiday. Uh, with that, we should move into our second review of the episode. Andy, uh, please take it away. Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning Part One. The longest title in the long-running uh, Mission Impossible <laughs> series. This is the seventh uh, film that that gets back our uh, team led by Tom Cruise's Ethan Hunt, leader of the uh, Impossible Missions Force, who once again has to rally uh, the, the team to stop a thing from destroying the world. Uh, in this iteration of the movie, there is uh, this AI that this super intelligent has possibly become self-aware and has gone rogue at itself as everything in these films do. Everyone goes rogue. Um, and so th- there is a race to control it. Um, there are several parties involved, including the, the IMF, MI6, CIA, outside buyers, all vying for control uh, of the AI. And, the, and it's controlled through uh, these two keys that in interlock and, uh, open a thing and, and control it. And that's our base setup. And we, like I said, we have a lot of people involved. It gets a little confusing. Uh, we, we have returning Ving Rhames, uh, Simon Pegg, Re- Rebecca Ferguson, Vanessa Kirby. They, they were all on the previous one. And newcomers, Haley Atwell, Palm Clementiev, who, of course, we know from Gardens of the Galaxy, and the great Henry Cherney, who was in the 1996 original Mission Impossible film, who uh, played uh, CIA director Kittredge. He is back in that same role and somehow looks exactly the same. So they really aged him up in that earlier movie and have probably aged him down a little bit. Um, there's a ton of action. There's a lot of fun. There's a, a lot of, how's, it, how's he going to get out of this situation? 
Uh, it's very long because it's two hours, 45 minutes. That's our setup. Zach, what'd you think? So I am not the biggest Mission Impossible fan. I should I should say that up front. And I know that this series has like a rich lore, like full of characters and motivations and plot lines that typically when you watch one of these movies is not really required reading. Like you don't have to do a lot of homework to go see Mission Impossible 7. Uh, thank God, right? Like I think that's kind of the best way to get into one of these movies because what you want to focus on is the action and the excitement and the charisma that Cruz and the rest of the cast are bringing. And all of those things were great. But boy, this is a full script for like a two two hour, 45 minute feature. There's a lot of details and there's a lot of people that are mentioned and motivations and, and they, they talk about the bad guy, the entity and, and the IMF and the organizations. Uh, and it's a Meyer, man. Like I really got caught up in it. And for some of those longer dialogue sequences, I was a little bored, but, uh, <laughs> I quickly hopped on IMDb and, and rotten tomatoes. When I got home, realized the movie has a robust 98% from a hundred, 198 critics, uh, which means I'm wrong. It's definitely a good movie. <laughs> and I've been surprised at how many people like really are into it. Like it's, it seems to be a hit critically. I, I feel like. A l like Indiana Jones or Transformers or a lot of these things, if you're a fan of the franchise, you're going to be happy with it. If you're not big on these big action films, um, you may not be as into it. But it it um these films work really well. I I actually but to get ready for this, I rewatched the original Mission Impossible, the 1996 one, and Mission Impossible Six uh, Fallout, which was the most recent iteration that had that Henry Cavill was in. Um, and there's a lot, uh, there's the lore sometimes is more or less, but, uh, they all have a, a lot, uh, kind of th that's similar. You know, there's a ton of action. There is an indecipherable plot. The plots are always so overly complicated. Like I'm watching seven or six, which I've seen more like a couple of times. No idea what's going on. No idea what Henry Cavill's up to, up to, um, same thing with the first one. And the plot through this is super kind of thick and co overly complicated there's a ton of people there's so many people in this movie it's, which doesn't help because that cuts down on screen time for everyone yeah it's strange like i i wouldn't identify because a lot a lot of these movies have this problem now yeah like they're a little too complex there's too many characters and i wouldn't identify those as like successful features of the franchise i would think those would be like you know things that would kind of get snipped and trimmed over time uh but no like director christopher McQuarrie seems to just come right back to it every time I, even more so in this movie uh visually this shares a lot of uh stylistic choices with the original film uh lots of Dutch angles, which I'm, dude, I'm so not into. <laughs> I, I, I can't do it. I, I've complained about this before. Uh, Ron Howard's The Grinch, uh, the Jim Carrey live action Grinch, is all Dutch angles. That whole movie. Ron Howard very explicitly was like, I wanted it to feel unique and different for kids who watch it, and it makes my brain light on fire. Like watching a whole movie where the camera's cocked to one side or the other, and this movie does it a lot. It's not all the time. Thank God that you can watch the trailer and realize that there's a lot more going on than just that um but between that and also like bouncing around in conversations uh is weird like there's supposed to be this kind of invisible line you don't cross on set whenever you're filming a conversation between two actors for visual distinction and clarity most films follow this uh this movie does not they they just break that rule they walk right across it the camera will bounce from the left of ving rames to the right and in, in the same conversation it'll move all around tom cruise i don't get it it takes a long time to film it that way i don't, I don't understand why they did it I, nobody will care because i nobody's going to notice but um uh, man just just a weird a weird decision that I think is supposed to be like the, like the older ones that I don't recall. Great tribute, uh, not for me though. Yeah, uh, this one this movie gets a little bit more into the cloak and dagger uh, style of spy films when there's like you know shifting alliances. You don't know who's who or who's working for whom. There's there's constantly this whole thing with uh, the the buyer or a secret buyer. Uh, this time embodied by Vanessa Kirby's character, the White Widow play the same character in the previous film um whose motivations are who knows what but you know she has one piece or she's a broker of information or intelligence or something and there's always someone buying something and someone arranging it to be bought but it gets confusing <laughs> the motivations of the various parties i i think there's like five or six people or 
parties interested in this thing that they're chasing, this key. And it just kind of gets confusing about what they're all doing and who's working with who because sometimes that they have uh you know similar interests and will align but it it shifts and it changes and you you can't keep it straight like i I need a diagram like while i'm watching the movie let's start with the action because those are the i think the sequences that people remember these films most for uh i can feel like i can confidently say mission impossible dead reckoning part one does not feature the best action of the franchise it's fine it's definitely better than some of the early ones um but nothing that really particularly stands out the big thing they've been touting in the marketing of course is tom cruise uh jumping a motorcycle off of a side of a mountain out in the austrian alps i guess you've probably seen that in ads uh additionally there's some stuff going on with the train uh, and there's like one other real big action sequence, and I'd say that pretty much tightens up your three large set pieces, Act 1, Act 2, Act 3. Overall, good, I think. <laughs> Overall, good. At least I should say I really did like this this car sequence in uh, Rome at the end of Act 1. Like, I think it's Rome. Rock solid. Uh, lots of movement, tangible motion. Probably the best car sequence I've seen all year. Um, the other one's fine. I just wish I hadn't seen him promote so damn much. God, I feel like I saw that. Tom Cruise jumping that motorcycle a million times before I saw it in theaters. Yeah, and it, it wasn't near as cool as the the big stunt in the previous movie was the uh, the halo jump, the high altitude jump out of the plane, and that that's amazing because there's a whole acting scene with him and Henry Cavill at the beginning, and then he just walks out of the plane, and you're like, "Where's the cameraman? <laughs> the cameraman yeah. had to do it too." Right. Um, that's a that's a, a super cool stunt, uh, you know, and you know the, the stunts from Top Gun Maverick as well really breathtaking they're better than most movies do they're better than indiana jones not as good as they've been in in past films i I feel like in fallout or in ghost protocol rogue nation they've been a lot uh a lot better um car chasing is is really good again that's better than any car chasing done this year and one of the things i appreciate about this franchise is that it they use a lot of practical effects when they can. I mean, they, they're shooting on location in these cities. They're crashing cars. They're breaking stuff. They're on real trains and, and planes. Uh, there's a big sequence at an airport at in this movie. Um, they're at an airport. Uh, so it's just, it really grounds it to just get on location and use practical effects. Yeah, uh, this is something I complained about in our Transformers uh, Rise of the Beast review. Uh, Michael Bay knows how important it is to film physical action like Mission Impossible does, like Christopher McQuarrie does, right? Film practical stuff. And then you enhance it with CGI and visual effects. But now, like, Transformers is moving in a direction where it's like, you're not really going to do that. You're going to have, like, one kind of car chase scene and the rest of it will be digital transformers right they'll just cgi the rest of it in uh mission possible like lovingly does not do that and i think that's really important there's definitely cgi in places right of course you can't avoid it but um it feels very kinetic like it feels very practical i think that stuff's important like tom cruise still runs like tom cruise is always running these movies you know like he's running i'm like he's going places he's got the uh, best cardio of any actor he, that's right in insane he's got the he's got the best thetans thetans uh he's got it all together and like i think that's good i also think this makes for a fine uh fine off script double feature with indiana jones because both see, both franchises feature you know lead actors who are getting older and one of the problems with indiana jones is uh indiana jones is not the same character he used to be he used to be this you know stud chad maverick like could do anything right now he's older and crotchety and he, he's, he doesn't have it anymore and watching an indiana jones movie without that central energy without that lightning bolt of a character in the middle can be a bit of a slog i think tom cruise still has it i do like as ethan hunt i think he's still exciting but as somebody who's not a big fan of these movies and just kind of goes and sees the offhanded one whenever it's out uh, I think it's wise that they start wrapping these up, right? Like they can't do many more Tom Cruise Mission Impossibles, and I think maybe moving in a direction where James Bond is headed, where you start talking about recasting. Hey, where's the series going to go in a few years? Probably smart, and I think Dead Reckoning is supposed to be that, right? This is supposed to be kind of the beginning of beginning of the end, maybe. Probably. I not. mean, he talked about doing these until he's eighty. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe maybe you, you give him an administrative role where he's like the he's like the guy at command directing people and you have someone else doing all the stunts 
Um, well, let's talk about our, our cast. Uh, we, we have a lot of familiar faces and a lot of new ones. Um, so let's start with our, our returning cast. Uh, Ving Rhames, somehow still in this <laughs> series after he, he wasn't, in, he wasn't, <laughs> he, he was of course famously in the, in the first mission impossible was not in, in two or three or four, I don't think. And then they brought him back, uh, for debt, uh, not dead reckoning rogue nation. And he's been in the last three, but he does less and less in the film. And he just, he kind of wears this dumb hat that gets tilted more and more in every <laughs> movie. <laughs> Yeah, I, I listen. Ving Rhames is a fine actor. All right, I, I shouldn't, I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be cruel. But my man does like five projects a year, and four of them are basically junk. And then he'll do a Mission Impossible movie, and every time he has like one costume change, and he's barely on set. And I'm like, why is he still in these movies? Like, how does Emilio Estevez get killed off in the very first one, in the prime of his career? Like, a, and and Ving Rhames, who's not doing anything exciting, is still like a core foundational piece of the mission impossible movies. Like if there's anybody you could ice on screen to like raise <laughs> the stakes and really scare Ethan hunt into realizing how serious this is, you blow up Ving Rhames and like, he's still kicking. <laughs> I don't get it. Like I Simon Pegg is back is, computers. Yeah. Like, and then, and then somebody says abort the mission and he closes his laptops frustratedly and stands up and then they just move him to that. Then he goes to his trailer. Like that's, that's, that's the day for Ving Rhames. Like I, it's fine. Simon Pegg's got a bit more to do back as Benji. Vanessa Kirby is exciting. Uh, Haley Atwell, newcomer, is surprisingly fun. Uh, you've seen her most recently in uh, what, what the Captain America franchise, right? Like she's uh, she's yeah, his, she, she's Peggy Peggy Carter. That's that's her thing. Uh, that's yeah, her claim she, to fame. Yeah, Avengers, yes, I mean, Marvel. Yes, in this she plays a functionally a pickpocket who kind of gets tangled up in Ethan Hunt's world and before she knows it can't get out. And of course, you have Tom Cruise as Ethan. Uh, overall, you know, fine. Like, good charisma. Everybody's got good delivery, even if sometimes they're saying lines like, we have to get the card back from the entity before Gabriel arrives. or so, Like, just the cheesiest cheeseball lines you've ever heard sounds like it fell right out of an action sitcom, which really is where Mission Impossible came from. They started, yeah, they, they refer to the AI as the entity, and it's kind of eye-rolling when they say it. Um, yeah, Cass is good. Haley Atwell's definitely being set up to continue to be part of, of this series, I think. Um, I read somewhere that she had, like, a two-hour audition that was all, like, stunt choreography, basically. Um, and she, she plays a major role in this film, which I'm kind of surprised at because it's, it's her first one. Um, Rebecca Ferguson is also back. Uh, love her character. She was first appeared in Rogue Nation. She's been in the last two. Um, and like I said, some of our returning Henry Cherney from the ori the original back is still kind of conniving CIA director. And Carrie Elwes uh, making a surprise appearance as the CIA director. Like I said, everyone's just like a director of a uh, this agency or or that. It was previously Alec Baldwin is the character, uh, but he died in the last movie. Bummer. Spoilers. Uh, spoilers. Yeah, sorry. rats. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no. Oh, overall, like as somebody who does not really hang out in the Mission Impossible space, like I think I had a fun time watching this movie, albeit just a little complicated. It's weird to get on the internet after and see it being praised for that because that's what a lot of these movies do, and the people that see them like them for that. It, it feels like I. It's like I never saw any, like, a James Bond movie, and then I go see one, and I'm like, God, this is all real cloak and dagger serious. And people are like, Yeah, that's what we want. And like, I've seen Mission Impossible movies. I've just never seen these as like a feature. I've seen this as a bug, but it seems that it's here to stay, and people like it. And as far as I know, if you like Mission Impossible. You're gonna like this movie. Yeah, I I I think so too. And I I wanted to mention that the, the one of the themes about the movie, which is ve they're very weak, but it's this whole AI thing they talk about. You know, if you control the AI, then you can control truth and, and the narrative. And there's this part where like they've created offices that are completely analog, no internet, no digital. This to you know be to be kind of free of it. And you know, there's a great sequence where. Uh, the this super intelligence is like interrupts their comms and starts uh you know copying everyone's voices and and giving them misdirection. Uh, so the movie kind of tries to touch on these themes of like the dangers of artificial intelligence uh, and kind of its place, but it doesn't get into it very. It just like scratches the surface. One more question before we move on to uh recommendations and then Nimona. Uh, 
this is part one of a part two, right? Like, and that's worth yes. mentioning because this has never happened in a Mission Impossible franchise. What do you think, Andy? How's it handle it? Is it is it underpaced because it has to set up for a part two that's supposed to be bigger and more bombastic? Does it feel maybe too full at two hours forty three minutes? Uh, where are we at? Wah, wah. So <laughs> I was I I compared this to um, Spider Verse, which uh, across the Spider Verse ends on a cliffhanger, and I remember being so excited at the end of that. I I just wanted to see another hour of it. Um, and I was super excited for the sequel, the sequel to come. It's very like Empire Strikes Back. Um, but Dead Reckoning is just, it kind of ends and I'm like, oh, I guess there's another one, but it's, and there's, there's some loose ends, but it's not exactly a cliffhanger. It's not exactly super exciting for, for like what's coming next. You're just like, oh, it's unfinished. Yeah. I would have rather it kind of wrapped as an adventure and left just a bit of a thread that the second one would tug on, you know, and instead it feels very boldly like one half of a bookend set. You know what I mean? Like here's a full featured something, but it's lacking a satisfaction at the end because it has to set up for part two for what it's worth credit where it's due uh, to Paramount and mission impossible for at least putting part one on the posters and trailers. Dune didn't do that. Spider verse didn't really do it. And people still came out of those theaters surprised like, Oh my God, I didn't know this was a part one. I thought there's going to be a whole thing. Like they at least told you in marketing it's part one. In fact, the film ends in its title card it says end part one. <laughs> which is which is hilarious uh they just give it right to you it, we're, you're coming back for more baby and and for better or worse that's mission impossible 7 and any other th- any other thoughts or recommendations i think i'm ready andy would you recommend mission impossible dead reckoning part one yeah i would especially if you're a fan of the mission impossible series you're getting a lot more of the things that they do really well getting fun characters big action set uh, set pieces which are really convincing and really you know dangerous um it's a little long at two <laughs> two hours 45 minutes it's nearly three hours long um it'll be a long night at the the cinema the plot is super complicated i don't know why they make them so complicated because we just really care about the action um <laughs> but but they are for whatever reason uh it's a good time at the movies and it, if you if you happen to have skipped indiana jones uh this is kind of the action movie to see yeah, I think I'm in the same boat. Uh, like I, you could wait to stream this just fine, but it really does play best on in in a theater, like on the big screen, with a good sound system too. I should say, good sound design in Mission Impossible: Dead Reckoning. Guns sound real punchy, like cars sound real loud. You know what I mean? Like it 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 roars at you, and I think that's good. That's what you want in these movies. Like you don't want to have to get too mired in the complicated. And like I told Andy when we were talking about this yesterday, it would be easy for these movies to just pull the Fast X thing, right? Uh, Ethan Hunt and Fred's could be like, oh, the agency called. We got another mission. Like, and that's just the setup for the movie. Like, just the most lazy conveyor belt-like approach. And at least, like, although it seems to roll through the same treads over and over, Ethan Hunt becomes rogue. Like, he's got to go do his own thing. Uh, it, It seems exciting enough that, like, Ethan comes off more as a veteran of a tired system and less like a tired part of an old system. That, that doesn't make any sense. But the point is Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, not a bad feature. Would recommend. And with that, we should move into our final review of the episode. We don't normally do three. And lately we've been doing three spurs because uh, we got big movies coming out <laughs> at the movies uh, and on Netflix, which is where our next feature is. Uh, I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, initially, we hadn't planned on it. But Andy had pitched it to me and said, hey, maybe we should watch this while I was up in uh, Michigan for the fourth. Uh, My uh, partner, Christine, had watched it and she was super stoked about it. So we got back into town, quickly watched it. Uh, The movie is uh, Nimona. So Nimona is the story of a young knight in a like cyberpunk medieval world, this clever mashup of styles full of computer screens and uh, castles and swords, right? Like of, of, of futuristic knight armor. Uh, our young knight, his name is, God, I don't even remember. Ballister, Ballister Boldheart. Boldheart. How could I forget? Old Ballister Boldheart, yes, uh, is, is to become knighted, to become uh, a former knight of the realm uh, when something happens something goes wrong and suddenly a uh, baluster is thrust into an unknowing situation uh, and he has to rely on the help of Nimona uh, this young 
creature uh, who has the ability to change form and shape at will and is uh, de- devilishly mischievous, right? Set out, sets out to be a villain, Nimona, whereas he just wants to restore his name and be a hero. It's an animated feature. Uh, and what's important to know about this is this was a Blue Skies Studios last feature they were working on before they were swiftly shut down by Disney upon acquisition of 20th Century Fox. Uh, Netflix bought the rights, adapted what they had, and produced Nimona. It is now out and coming out to surprisingly good reviews. Uh, the movie is Nimona on Netflix. Andy, what did you think? Yeah, I, I like this. It's a fun little film. It's short. It's only 100, 100 minutes. Um, it it I wasn't with it in initially because it's ve- it's very kind of cutesy and and fun and very kind of aimed at young audiences. But it gets more serious the longer it goes. Uh, the animation style is fun, and it you know it's it's um it's kind of taking some jabs at the I think at Disney and at uh just kind of the. Uh, fairy tale in general like i said we have this almost like medieval punk <laughs> cyberpunk kind of thing where it's both very old and very technologically advanced and you know you have names like ambrosius golden loin <laughs> who's uh one of the antagonists uh so just a lot of the, those funny things uh chloe grace moretz is really great as nimona is incredibly animated uh character she's someone who kind of functionally can't really be hurt and so she's not careful. Like she doesn't sneak around the castle. She does. She like breaks. She always wants to just break stuff. And it's really funny. She's not worried about I- anything they ru- run into. Um, and she develops a really fun relationship with uh, Ballister played by Riz Ahmed. Um, as they try to kind of clear, clear his name uh, from this alleged wrongdoing. Yeah. Uh, also, a quick mention for Eugene Lee Yang as uh, Ambrosius Goldenloin, who's a real character. Uh, he's actually really fun. He's from uh, the Try Guys on the internet. If you watch that, shout out to him. Uh, and Beck Bennett from SNL, who plays this like goofy night bully kind of character, right? Like, love Beck Bennett. He's great. We saw him in uh, what Greener Grass, underrated feature. Uh, and that's what I think this movie is underrated. Like, I know I people have been saying oh it's good you should check it out but like i think it's not getting a lot of attention because it's animated and it looks a little strange on the front with like the 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 knight armor and like the laser weapons uh the world of nimona is really well put together because it doesn't spoon feed you like it just drops you in on the day that ballister is to be knighted and he's stressed about it uh, and his partner Ambrosius is like, it's going to be cool. Like we're going to work it out. Um, like, and you see this world kind of unfold in front of you where like you have all of these castles and like old village kind of town set up, but it's like covered in this coating of technology screens and, and, and people got iPads they are walking around with and <laughs> laser things and like cells with, 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 uh, led lighting on them. And all of that is wrapped in an animation style that is incredibly well budgeted because I think this movie is well storyboarded. The shots they have look really good, but they're cheap. Like, uh, they, they go for cell shading. So it's not expensive to like color your film, bright saturated lights and big, big, big colors like to, to kind of distract from lack of shading, like lack of depth. You end up getting a feature that like is functionally not much more different than like an episode of star Wars, the clone wars, like that came out on cartoon network, like a TV show budget. Um, but that looks really great. And you combine that with great voice acting, uh, headed by Chloe Grace Moretz. And you get a feature with like a lot of energy and a lot of bounce on a budget. Like that's surprisingly effective. I don't know if that's why Disney shut it down. Um, but it's really great that Netflix managed to pull it out here because it ends up being uh, a lot bigger than it seems on the page. Yeah. It's a fun little film and it gets serious. It's surprisingly about like, uh, the dangers of propaganda and nationalism. <laughs> I was like, this is a kid's film. It's taking off some like really serious things. Cause they, the whole kingdom is, you know, they have this long and storied like mythology of this person who like fought back the, the bad things to, you know, bring peace to the land. And then you kind of learn like, you know, maybe this story isn't everything that it uh, has been cracked up to be. 
Yeah, it's uh, delightfully gay. It's worth mentioning. Uh, Ballister and Ambrosius are together, right? They're boyfriend boyfriend, which is really exciting. And, and Chloe Grace Moretz's uh, Nimona is uh, functioning a character who's transitioning between forms at will and never really identifies as one or the other, which is a struggle for Ballister to kind of grow to understand. But overall, I think it works really well. It comes off a little heavy handed for it to be for me personally, but I feel like if you're younger, right? If you're family watching this, like it feels wholesome. It's not too too in your face like I think that stuff works really well and it's good for kids who are trying to you know learn about identity and like kind of feel out who they feel themselves to be like I think that's important uh you know so that stuff works um Andy why do you think Disney kicked this one any any thoughts any hot takes I, I don't really have a theory I just I don't know want to mention it before we wrap up uh, I mean I think it's just it's not really the Disney brand and it's definitely poking fun at the Disney brand um, so I think yeah. that that's probably why why they're not wanting to uh, re- release or you know they didn't want to pick it up they didn't want to release it they didn't want anything to do with it yeah it's funny like I, I think it's it's bold for what's here like not only in its subject matter but in its presentation it's not as exciting animation wise as something like Mitchell's vs. Machines or Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse even something like the Lego movie but like at least it feels different right like it doesn't go for like the hyper realistic kind of angle that Disney's often known for um, they're trying to move away with that now with things like Elemental but like a lot of it feels like Disney animation, right? Big eyes on your characters or a lot of the animals that Nimona will turn into look like they fell out of a Disney movie. Her gorilla, I swear to God, looks like a gorilla from Tarzan. <laughs> she turns into a deer at one point and I'm like, that's Bambi's dad. That's what that looks like. Like it is the same lines, like the same the same style of animation inspires these characters. So it's a little weird that it got dumped. It's a bummer for Blue Sky. Like I think a lot of great animators that were working over there. Um, I don't know, but I'm glad I'm glad I got turned around. You know, I'm glad I got made. This is this is an example of Netflix or a streamer picking up kind of a half done project, and I think actually carrying it over the finish line in a satisfying way. I'd put it up there with something like Klaus on Netflix, like or even Mitchell's vs. Machines, like an animated feature you will probably go back to, and I think that's good. Like God, it yeah. doesn't happen every day. It's cool that we get to talk about it right here on the show. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. It's something that um, I think will ha- have some staying power. You could revisit it again with your your family, with your kids at different ages. I, I feel like you'll see this movie differently at uh, di- different ages, just, you know, especially someone if you see it when you're young. And like I said, it's a quick hundred minutes. Love that. <laughs> so everything's three <laughs> hours these days. Oppenheimer is three hours. Oppenheimer is three hours. Yeah, let's, get, let's just hit the recommendations real fast. Andy, would you recommend Nimona? I would. It, it's, it's a sweet family uh, kids movie. That has a lot of um, has a lot of charm. It's it's funny. Great performances by the leads Riz Ahmed and Chloe Grace Moretz. Um, some good messages about not believing everything you, you hear or that you're told about the place you grew up in. Um, yeah, I highly recommend. Yeah, same. I think the is really cool. Uh, would recommend. Lots of fun. Decent date movie too. If you're into that, like pretty soft, soft gloves. Not too tough. Decent decent resolution. Would recommend a moment on Netflix. Andy, next week's going to be wild. I don't know if I'm ready for next week. Like, not only go to the theater, but, like, to talk about, you know, what we got to talk about. What are we watching? Barbenheimer is upon us. Um, and this is... Cultural exact- event of the decade. <laughs> so this is, isn't is exactly next week because uh, Mission Impossible comes out tomorrow, Wednesday, and so it's kind of running for, like, a week and a half. And then July 21st, is when both Barbie and Oppenheimer are open in theaters nationwide. Uh, we already have tickets to see Oppenheimer in glorious 70 millimeter IMAX. Uh, one of the, one of the only few IMAX uh, true IMAXs in Texas. Uh, that's just right down the street. Three hours. Uh, which one are you seeing first, Zach? Uh, I got tickets for Barbie first. I got tickets for Barbie Thursday night opening night, and then we're doing. Oppenheimer on Sunday. You're probably in the same boat because we got Sunday Oppenheimer, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. seeing Barbie first as, as well. I do um, think it's the it's the worst way to do it. It'd probably be better to watch Dark Oppenheimer first and then go get a laugh <laughs> from Barbie. But you know what? It'll be fine. I get to go home Sunday and think about the horrors of reality. You know, admittedly, you know, I, I did jump the gun on the early though. You're right. It's the 21st. We gotta wait a minute, but it's coming. Oh, it's coming. It's um also. 
speaking of uh you know the order of which you watch i was listening to another show where they they had actually they had to watch um mission impossible first they had advanced tickets to that and then indiana jones <laughs> and that's uh that's a rough way to watch yeah no movies. <laughs> I, think, I think we got the better spin out of the two of them for sure Oh, gosh. If you enjoyed the show today, if you want to keep up with, again, Barbenheimer, cultural event of the summer, uh, if you have any hot takes on our thoughts on Mission Impossible or Indiana Jones or new movies coming up, to stories to talk about, movie news, anything like that, best way to reach us is to email us at mail at offscriptfilmreview.com. You can comment, of course, uh, wherever you find the show, whether it's on Facebook, where our live streams go up, whether it's on YouTube. Insane things happening on the Oscar YouTube page. You got to go check it out. It's wild you the dude the youtube's blowing up i'm telling you watch out you'll you, you, you'll forget us when we're famous whatever uh the youtube channel is where a lot of things are happening we're on twitter we're on instagram we haven't started a threads yet but like that'll probably come down the line at some point yeah. <laughs> as soon as they uh, add multiple accounts yeah as soon as that boy as soon as they add multiple accounts that's that, then then we'll take off uh and of course we're in all the usual podcast places itunes google play spotify iHeartMedia. you can rate and review wherever you find us like and subscribe that stuff helps us immensely. I have no idea how helpful it is to young up-and-coming podcasters. We really appreciate it. And, of course, you can check out our website for everything we do and more media interviews, clips, videos, whatever, at telescriptfilmreview.com where we host all this stuff all the time. Uh, man, really excited for what's next. Y'all, y'all are going to have to stay tuned. From all of us at Offscript, the home, the Bold Cinema, I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Thanks for watching.